and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, the madman behind Vindicated Entertainment, and is responsible for various projects like like other worlds, banishment, and now and now coming to us with Truck Coon, which is a a, a game all about isekai. And if it and given that the <laughs> the name is a little bit short, given some names of isekai we've seen, the one and only <coughs> Vincent Baker. How are we doing today, man? We're doing pretty good, all things considered. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, this is a wee bit early for me, considering my vampiric nature, but um, I'm happy to be here nonetheless. Mm -hmm. so yeah, and I mean, speaking of the uh, short truck who name, I actually did consider that, and I noticed my artist, like for the logo, threw like a subtitle on it where it's like, you know, please bring me to a beautiful world or something like that. So, you know, it still has that like isekai feel, but I don't want that to be the official game title. So it's sort of in this weird limbo of like being there in the logo, but like not me not wanting to count it as part of the actual name. I can get I can get that. Yeah, it's like please, I don't want to have to actually type that out every time. And like Truck Coon's just such a more solid like name, you know, like even like legally speaking wise is like a trademark or something. It's like you'd rather just have like Truck Coon and not have this giant ass name that you have to worry about. Mm -hmm. Although I'm I'd imagine somebody's gonna try and figure out a way to fight to come up with the longest name possible for a a title of of something. You know, I've I've probably had that thought run past my mind and then like leave me, but I think of stuff like that sometimes. Like, let me just figure out like a way to do something different. But sometimes when you like are in like a game designer's brain and you're trying to do something innovative or different, um, I feel like sometimes you have to tell yourself that different in itself isn't always a good thing. And sometimes it can just be like a novel thing that isn't really there to do anything. So I, I kind of, if I do something different, I kind of want it to be more than just different for the sake of being different. I want it to be different in a way that I think is cool or interesting or fun for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, it was exciting that you said the, the madman behind vindicated. I, I haven't, I haven't had anyone hint at me being mad in, in a very long time. I remember in high school, someone gave me the nickname Vinsanity. Uh, so that was, and, and they were just trying to come up with a nickname for me, I think. I don't think it really had any relation to anything, but it definitely threw me back to my high school years when you said that. Mm -hmm. Which, if I, I mean, mo most people, I try. I try not to call. I try not to call back to my own high school years because there. Because um, I'm pretty sure there's still a few people. There's still a few people at the re at the reunions who are still mad at me over some of my stunts. Um. <laughs> okay. Yeah. For those uh, listening, uh, Mildred was telling me about some of his stunts at his workplace uh, involving coffee. So mm -hmm. I'm sure that he had all kinds of stuff going on in high school as well. Um. Yeah. There was. Th there was the whole thing of the, of them not allowing us to play cards during during lunch, so I, I being a smartass, brought out a copy of Yahtzee and we played that. Hey, uh, so about that, about playing cards and stuff at lunch. Uh, I think when you and I were in high school, that was basically universally banned. But uh, you may be happy to know that since I've released card games, I've actually heard students tell me that teachers are excited when they see them playing Spellslingers or Gulatine. Like, they love seeing them play these games because they're like, oh, thank goodness, they're no longer on their, like, phones or on Switch or they're not, like, disconnected. They're actually playing with other students. They're actually, like, involved in, like, learning, like, basic math and, like, you know, just, like, involved in interacting with one another. And so things have come, like, full circle in a way at schools where it seems like in a large way, teachers are just, like, super excited for them playing cards. Uh, and it's cool whenever I hear that they're playing, like, my card games. Because uh, I've, I've actually heard quite a few stories about that. And it's just, it's kind of funny how things have gone from one end to the other when it comes to that. Yeah, every, yeah, time is a flat circle. Oh, I, was I was just a rampant smart, 
a rampant smartass because when they when they got on me about that, I said, "You said no card games. Yahtzee's a dice game." So as far as, <laughs> so as far as far as I'm concerned, I didn't break any rules. <laughs> but yeah, so then they had to add a, like a little amendment and be like, "All right, and dice games, and board games, and <laughs> RPGs." And... <laughs> but I, I mean the the. What some people consider the the worst the worst thing I ever did was putting up flyers warning about dihydrogen monoxide. You know, I uh, yeah, you know, I'm not water. familiar enough in this. So yeah, yeah, okay, cool. So you just put up flyers about water? Yeah, I just I just made it I just made it a bit sca- a bit scary sounding. The that the dihydrogen monoxide thing has been a running joke in chemistry circles for years. And gotcha. Okay. Around that time, I had listened to the War of the Worlds broadcast for the first time, and I got an idea. Hmm. <laughs> okay. I see. I see. I'm following. As Dr. Seuss would say, a wonderful, awful idea. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Is that an actual quote from Dr. Seuss? It's fr- It's one of the. It's one of the. It's one of the lines from The Grinch. Okay. You know, the Grinch got a wonderful, awful idea about sealing Christmas. Okay, yeah, no, I like that. That's fun. But some, it's funny that um, isekai ended up being the focus because I've I've stated that the concept of isekai is not as new as people think it is. In fact, you yeah. can say it's at least two hundred years old. Because th- you could, I'm not an, I'm not a hundred percent with it, but you could argue that. Through the Looking Glass, also known as Alice in Wonderland, is an early example. I say I'm not a hundred percent willing to go with that because there, because there's just as strong of an argument that that story was just one bad trip instead of her actually going to another world. If I can't use that as an example, I'll bring up um, John Carter, which was which that also known as the Barsoom Saga um, was a hundred years ago. That was one of Edgar Rice Burroughs other projects other major projects I should say yeah well I think that's a fascinating idea is like tracing back like sort of like the roots of like the earliest types of isekai stories and and stuff um I haven't really considered that but that is I think that is pretty fascinating in its own regard well I'm not sure if you've read through um John Carter but the the central premise is the titular character and ending up getting spirited away, or the the method in which how how he gets there is not consistent. But he ends up on Mars, and because of the lower gravity, he's able to he's able to be a lot stronger th- there. And a lot of sh- a lot of shenanigans happen after after the fact. And yes, part of it is him leaping buildings in a single bound because John Carter's influenced a lot of things. <laughs> and that in- that includes the original Superman. Yeah, no, it's kind of wild whenever you trace back like the roots of things. Like, there's so many like interesting tidbits that you can find out about it. Yeah, but yeah, for me, it's kind of wild that I sort of got involved making Truck Coon because I, uh, people might assume like because I'm making it, I'm like the hugest isekai like anime fan, but that's not really the case. Uh. I, I do enjoy anime, and there's some isekai I enjoy. Um, ReZero is my favorite one, but it's sort of more of a deconstruction of the genre itself. Um, and I love Konosuba. Those are probably the two main ones. But I, I just sort of like woke up with the idea, and to me it sounded like a challenge to make a game that the, the premise was about being hit by a truck, reincarnate to a different world. And like the the whole thing just sort of came together in my mind when I woke up from this dream I had about it. And I was like, okay, well, let me just see if I put this together, if it's any fun. Uh, and it ended up being a good time. And then I sort of also like saw a unique challenge in, in like making a co-op version. Cause I don't typically do co-op stuff uh, when it comes to card games I do, mm-hmm. but I, I always try to look at that option to see if it's something that is actually fun and most of the times for the games I make, it doesn't. It seems more like it's a forced thing I'm trying to do, so I don't really include it. You know, like with Gulatine, there's not a co-op way to play, and it it just didn't seem like a game that really served itself. And I didn't want to force myself to throw one in there just because 
you know, for the sake of having one, even though I didn't think the gameplay would live up to it, you know. But with Truck Coon, it actually ended up being so much fun that there's a lot of people that just really enjoy playing co-op for it. And it's like, okay, cool. So it's, uh, I'm actually happy with how that came out. And it's sort of sort of like a weird game to have it for because it was so PvP oriented when I first designed it. But I'm happy, I'm kind of going on a tangent, but I'm happy there's a co-op version too. Yeah. Now, with that with that in mind, Truck Coon is, is set up as a, um, as a, as a full on card game built around go, built around being isekai into different worlds was was that the direction that you want that you wanted to go in right out of the gate or were there some iterations where it had to be reset uh right off the gate my initial concept for it was that these these different worlds would basically be combined by mixing and matching cards and the cards would sort of inform you on what's going on. So, you know, currently in the game, there are subject cards, there's world cards, and they form your isekai. So you can have, like, you know, reincarnated as Santa on the moon, or reincarnated as a toaster in Underwater World, or wherever it may be. Like, those things can all, like, mix and match and happen. Like, I knew I didn't want to just, like, write out my own world, because I thought some of the comedy came from, like, the way things mix and match. And whenever you do that you actually end up having like a ton more combinations. So instead of me just writing out 40 different worlds and, and detailing those or whatever, um, I felt like having so that mix and match element, now there's like over 800 combinations of what can happen. And some of the subjects and some of the worlds have different mechanics on the cards. And so how they mix and match together can also increase the different uh, types of strategies that you'll encounter based on how they mix and match. So I know I've used that term a lot, mix and match, but that's actually something that I like to use in some of my games just because it, it greatly increases the variability, which is something I enjoy a lot in games because I hate repetition. Like whether it's in card games or video games or anything I'm doing, whether it's at work, I hate doing the same thing over and over again. So if someone is playing a Vindicated game, uh, you can be rest assured that I tried very hard to make sure that there wasn't a ton of repetition. I love there to be variability because I will go crazy if it's the same thing, especially since I have to show off the game to so many people so many times at conventions, at events. Mm -hmm. I, I have to make sure I don't get bored of the game, and I get bored of things very easily. So, <laughs> so, I, so if you're someone like that that also hates repetition, then definitely check out some of uh, my Vindicated games. Now, because of the fact that creating the isekais are combinations of subject cards and world cards, I do have to ask if anyone's brought up um, cards, against human cards Against Humanity to you when it comes to this concept, because that's one of the things that immediately crept up while I was going through this and doing prep. Yeah, no, I totally get that. Um, it's It's funny because I do think... I do think there's an element there, um, for sure. Uh, what's interesting, though, is Cards Against Humanity is such a loaded game. Like, there's so much baggage that comes with it, like good and bad. So, and what I mean by that is, for example, a lot of my audience uh, tends to be a little bit more casual focus. Not every one of my audience, but you know, a decent bit. And so, a lot of them actually love Cards Against Humanity. And so, in that way, they enjoy that aspect of it because it's a little bit familiar. But everything else surrounding the game, there's a lot of other there's a lot of other components to the game that make it so different than Cards Against Humanity because there's actual like strategy elements where you have to outplay your opponents, and that's unlike anything in Cards Against Humanity. But on the flip side of that, with the baggage that comes with it being sort of assumed with Cards Against Humanity, is that a lot of people in the tabletop space, they see Cards Against Humanity as sort of like this anomaly where they like hate it, they think it's like a very badly designed game, or they hate how popular it is, or whatever it may be. Um... You know, I kind of get it, too, because it's almost, like, so big that it's just like, okay, guys, can we play something else? You know, I, I, I get it. Um, but there, there's a, a contingent of people that hate that game so much that just by thinking of that, if they see Truck Coon, they would, like, hate Truck Coon by extension. Um, so that is something I've had to dealt with, or I've had to deal with, rather. Um but, you know, it is what it is. I mean, I think what's interesting is, you know, there's different elements you can sort of dissect from the game. Uh, and you can sort of, like, say, like, okay, well, the mixing and matching of these two different cards feels a bit like Cards Against Humanity. But, you know, the... You know, uh, there's a whole... Like, one of the main gameplay features is 
people is each player placing a card face down from their hand mm -hmm. and then you compare their numbers and then whoever has the highest number resolves their effect first then you go in descending order and then you go from highest number to lowest and claiming different isekai for points and the trick is is that some of the cards will outplay the others almost in this sort of like elaborate like this um very in-depth version of like rock paper scissors or something or something like it, it actually kind of has like a stratego feel yeah. um if people yeah and that and no one really ever compares stratego with cards against humanity but here we are with truck coon where it's like anime meets stratego meets cards against humanity and that that's just kind of a wild combination that's part of what makes the game fun yeah and if 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 i have to use an alt if i have to use an alternative i can always break out mad libs um <laughs> yeah, there you go. In both cases, you're still you're still filling in the blanks to certain prompts, and there was a um, there was another fill in the blanks um, project th that I've that I've used on a few occasions that I honestly think I sh I want to see used at more conventions, and that is Channel A, and Channel A is essentially a card game about pitching anime. Okay, cool. Yeah, I haven't heard of that one. Mm -mm. But uh. The other, the other thing is the fact that this is not a str this is this is not a solely card game because you are using the um dice ra the dice randomizer. Um was that something that was done just to make things a little less re repetitive since you mentioned you don't like doing the same things over and over? Yeah, that's a big reason for it. I mean, I found out that uh my my audience and myself included, uh, we love rolling dice. Uh, so, it, you know, it feels a bit more interactive. People like to roll, see if they get a high roll, low roll, stuff like that. And there's those moments, too, where, like, you're hoping for some high numbers and you get the low numbers. And maybe you're hoping, based on the worlds, you might actually hope for a low number because the isekai that get formed may uh, have the mechanic that they're all negative. And you don't want to get stuck with a negative one, so you're hoping that you actually roll low and you actually roll high. So there's a lot of, like... It, you know, it really goes in flux between, like, what you want and what you're rolling, and it does change the variability. I also felt weird just sort of assigning a dice number to each subject or world card in itself because I I wanted players to have that agency of determining, like, oh, yeah, no, like, you know, being, um, you know, a tiny orange man in World War II is, like, way funnier than being handcuffed to a furry in jail or whatever it may be. Like, like or whatever, like, the, the player can have that agency to decide, like, oh, this is the cooler isekai or this is the funnier one and sort of assign the points that way if that's what they want to do. Uh, of course, if we get more, like, gaming-centered people playing it, uh, they sort of put less attention into the humor of the isekai itself and they just sort of... You can sort of just apply the numbers as you want, minus the mechanics that may show up on the on the different isekai. Um, but yeah, I think having the the numbers roll just has increased like a lot of fun because it's variability, player agency, um, and a lot of like sort of like ups and downs when it comes to like what people want and like what people get from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. Now, it's, with yeah, it's also a good way to sort of like show like the top of the round too, because I feel like without the rolling part, it, it's almost like it feels more like it's in phases. Because it's like, all right, new round starts. All right, here's the truck meeple. It moves to you. All right, roll the dice. Uh, oh, actually, sorry, the truck meeple moves over to you. We form the isekai. Roll the dice. We play our characters face down. Then we resolve. Then we repeat. It just it feels like. It feels like that step kind of helps like break up things a bit because like sometimes there's card games that you play where the each step is sort of like so seamless that you almost get like lost in it as you keep doing it because it's like you're kind of doing the same thing so quickly over and over and over and over again that like I've noticed some players just sort of end up getting confused at like whose turn it is or what's going on or like um, you know it just sort of gets like muddied within itself and I feel like this helps like distinguish it in a way that's still easy for people to it still resonates with people easily um and it's just like a fun mechanic and so it just moves things along in the right way mm -hmm. now with a lot of board and card games there are rule variants and while the core rule for for this is is of course the first to 20 i am curious if you if in the um rule set that you do have variant setups 
That's a good question. Um, I know I was messing around with an alternate rule for that, because um, currently it's whoever gets to the first to 20 or more um, wins the game. Uh, I do feel like... Hmm. Now you're having me like second guess, because I'm like, there was something I was messing with. Uh, I will say I did play test multiple different variants of this, and whatever is the standard rule in the in the book, which I do believe is like if you hit 20 or more, uh, is the one that ended up playing the best, you know? So I did try some different ones, uh, and there were some other ones I thought w might would be better. Mm -hmm. But uh, that one was just definitely the one that played the best, so th that's the one that I stuck with. Um, there are some optional ways. Uh, when it comes to rule variants, though, we actually just unlocked a stretch goal for quest cards. And quest cards are an additional like variant to play, uh, where essentially, like in the base game, everyone gets the same set of fantasy characters that you can play. So you can you know what your opponent has, and so you can try to outmaneuver them. You know, if they play the villain, you can try to play the hero to beat the villain, that kind of thing. Uh, with quest cards, each one is different, and each player gets one that is random, that or one that you're not sure what it is, and it will be different than what you have. And it's going to be face down, almost like a trap card in Yu-Gi-Oh! And then they can spring that on you at any point during the game to sort of change the way things are played uh, mm -hmm. for them. And so that can really turn things on its head and add a whole different dimension dimension to the game. So that is a, an example of like a rule variant that people can use uh, that will, yeah, change up things. Mm -hmm. Now, so with, with some games, there's a certain, a certain kind of sweet spot where, where it's, where it's just enough participants. You know, some ga some games are very clearly meant for maybe three maybe three or four people. Some can handle more. What would you What would you say would be the um would be the range when it comes to the preferable amount of people in a game of Truck Coon? Yeah. So real quick, I was pulling up the rules to see, like, to double check about the objective. So as we both discussed, twenty points to win the game. Uh, yeah, so that is the main rule. I did put for longer games, and this is what the current rule book is, it might be altered or edited later, but it says for longer games, uh, play until a player cannot play a character card from their hand, then whoever has the most points wins the game. So there is a, there is a variant where if you want to play a longer version, uh, basically everyone plays until, until people can no longer play a character from their hand, and at that point you see who has the highest amount of points. Um, that way you keep going even if someone hits 20 and you see who get, who can get to the highest so you can play it that way. Mm -hmm. Now, um, okay, yeah. I was going to say back to your other question. Um, you're asking sort of how long the game takes in general because uh, there's different games that can have different links and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I would say it's normally like a 30 minute game. Uh, so, you know, and it's really easy to set up, you know, it's like one of those games you can just break. I don't like games that take longer to set up than they do to play, or they take an hour, an hour and a half to set up. Like, it better be a really fun game if it takes that long, you know? Um, so this game you can set up in, like, five minutes, and then you can play for, you, you can have, like, a 30-minute session, and that's just for your, like, typical version of playing it, and then after you do that, you can all jump into a co-op version if you want. Uh, I'm working on one of the bosses included in the, uh, boss pack that we just unlocked on, uh, Kickstarter. Um, I'm working on it to be sort of like a gauntlet boss where it's sort of like a more long form, like you have to defeat other bosses before you get to this final boss. But that's just like one way you can play it. That's if you want to play a longer session of Truck Coon. But if you want to do a shorter session, you can just fight off against one of the other bosses, you know, like a quote unquote like mini boss instead, doing co op that way. Or you can do the traditional PvP version. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, when it comes to bosses was sorry, <clears throat> was that something that was added in midway through development or was that something you had planned on from the get go definitely midway through development i i originally was not i didn't think there was any way i could make this game into a co-op game and it'd be fun at all i <laughs> i cuz <laughs> cuz the game itself I mean, it'd be like saying, like, oh, yeah, make, you know, Cards Against Humanity Stratego a co-op game. Like, that just sounds, like, so insane. Like, it sounds like there's no way that would work. Uh, just the idea of, like, claiming Isekai, you know, and, and getting points from it and stuff, just it does not seem like a game that would work for, for co-op. But um, I sort of had the idea, and I tried it, and people ended up really liking it. 
I mean, to the point where, like, people, you know, when I was playtesting the game, you know, people already was loving the PvP version, and they were telling me they wanted to keep playing it and stuff like that. Uh, but now when I show people the co-op version, I'd say about half the people, like, prefer that version to the main version I made. Um, so, yeah, so, um, but I feel like it sort of rounds out the game a lot, too. Um, it gives it a lot more depth. It gives, it gives like, a whole other dimension to the game, and then I feel like it sort of fills out that idea of an isekai as well, because, you know, in an isekai, there's always a big bad boss, you know, so it fits that, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's, and, um, it certainly, certainly fits the motifs that are, pr- that are going to be present. Now, with that in with that in mind, um, what would you say were some of because because I I believe you did do some playtesting for this at some conventions. What were some of the big takeaways that you had with some of those early tests? Yeah, the biggest takeaway was um, let's see, my first playtest for it was January of last year, and uh, luckily, you know, the reception was really good. People really liked it. Um. Uh, okay, let me let me think of. Hmm. You know, so the, so funny enough, the, that play test just went really well. Uh, now that I'm thinking back to it, and like things were good. There was sort of like a lot of cards and a lot of pieces, and there's a lot of dice. Like dice were being used for points, and dice were being used for rolling, and you know it was kind of like a little chaotic in that way. So like in the final game, now we have these little like gem crystals for the points. So you're not using dice as the points because. If you're doing that, then you could like accidentally hit the dice and knock over your points, or you might accidentally roll your own points to like play the game and accidentally do that and mix it up. Um, so, you know, and it wasn't necessarily even that I was playing on using dice for the final interpretation for points. It was just sort of like what I had at the time. Um, but soon after that, with playtesting, um, it seemed like there were definitely a, con- a contingency of certain players that got no enjoyment from the the humor of different isekai being formed. And so things became a little um, mundane for them because none of the isekai at that point had any mechanics or any, like, keywords that changed up the way the game played. So, for example, now there's currently, like, isekai that can be formed that can end up being worth negative points. Or there can be ones that are known as chaos isekai. Mm -hmm. And if if someone claims a chaos isekai, it re-rolls the value of all the other isekai still in play. Uh, or there's familiar isekai, which ends up adding a whole nother isekai into play, so there's more worlds up for grabs. And so, before, so there, so basically, there were people kind of, uh, people that were a little bit more into gaming kind of felt like there was something missing. They, they kind of felt like they just wanted a little bit extra, is a little bit too bare bones. And, um, like I said, they weren't getting as much from the just forming the funny cards or whatever. Um, and these would also be your players that are not into Cards Against Humanity. Like, the people that are into Cards Against Humanity, they, they seem like it was perfectly fine. Uh, they had a great time before the mechanics were involved. Um, but I felt like the mechanics did add enough, like, extra fun without making it complicated um, that I ended up trying it out. People ended up enjoying it, and it seemed to appease both crowds. So whether I play it with someone that is more against, uh, a more Cards Against Humanity person or someone who isn't, it seems like they both had a fun time with those new mechanics and that they were easy to understand. So it seemed like a win-win, so we went with it. Mm-hmm. I, can, I, can certainly, I can certainly understand that. Uh, and, ha- if in, and I just realized what um, parallel that could somewhat could somewhat apply, although this might be a bit of a left field um, parallel. <laughs> okay, that is my that is my experience with the Kingdom Hearts card game when it was published by Fantasy Flight Games back in the late two thousands, late two thousands, early twenty tens. Um, it wasn't made by them; it was made by Tomy. They just had the English version, but I remember it being sound. But the problem was there were no bad ideas or no or no ba- no bad plays for lack of a better term mm. and it did it did kind of make the encounters kind of samey gotcha yeah that's an interesting point that i don't think is really brought up in game design is the idea that like if you have the potential to make bad plays it actually increases like the variance in which people can do and if like every play basically equates to a similar outcome or the same outcome, 
then you just it ends up becoming samey and it's it doesn't feel as much like a game anymore. Mm-hmm. It's the ne- I've ta- I've um had this discussion elsewhere and and I think in the case of say using dice I think a lot of people assume have a bit of a misunderstanding. Not a misunderstanding a misunderstanding. <laughs> and there, and yes there is a difference. That in do, that um that they that they're meant to add ra- that they're meant to add randomness or that dice are too random or, or something like that and I have I've argued that in that um in both role playing games bo- board games card games you need to have some degree of of unpredictability some degree of risk in in a lot of standard card games, the risk is whether or not you're going to actually get the card that you need for the play that you want to want to make, or whether or not some whether or not your play is going to get countered. You know, in a role playing game, the risk comes from doing an action that may work work for you or work against you. You know, yeah, r- it... risk reward is something that I constantly. Um, get on yeah i feel like my games at vindicated have uh sort of there's definitely a contingency of people that sort of lobby like oh it's very luck based or this or that like i i definitely hear that a lot um it there's a there's a lot of things i can say on this topic i mean one is that it sort of depends on your audience you know i i agree that like i've been through the whole ameritrash euro euro game debacles over the years that argument yeah was really dumb yeah because here's my thing i mean like my audience i'm trying to get new people into the hobby you know that's part of like what i'm doing with vindicated is i'm getting people into card games board games rpgs that before like basically you'd ask them like hey are you into card games they're like "Uh, not really or maybe they'll be like yeah kind of but then but they're thinking cards against humanity or something very you know at that very like surface level and then I show them like, hey, there's like more you can play. There's there's some things that have a whole different aspect to them that you can get into, and then they actually become more of a card gamer or board gamer because of what I'm making. Um, and part of that is, you know, allowing your game to have aspects to where if I play it a hundred percent and if I'm trying my best, there's still a percentage chance I can lose to someone who's new or trying to learn the game that might not know all the ways to optimize it. Um, and that way it feels good for them because they need to feel like they can actually win sometimes because if they, if they don't feel like they can win and if they never can win, that's going to discourage them and get them to quit. Um, and they're not going to have a good time playing. Uh, with that being said, um, I don't say this like, I don't like saying this at all because it feels almost like a, a way of like bragging or like I'm, I'm like, putting bad uh, bad aura on myself on this, but when it comes to Truckkin, what's interesting is there's so much variability to it, but my friend pointed out that he's never seen me lose a game of Truckkin, and after he mentioned that, I've realized I've actually never lost a game of it. Um, and I, But see, here's the thing, though. It seems like people always feel like they can win. Like pe- Every time I play with someone, like... It's, I don't see people getting mad at me, being like, dude, you always win. Like, what is this? You know, it feels like, oh, I was so close to beating him, you know, maybe next time. And, I, I mean, you could say that's just, like, all luck. But I feel like there's, like, oddly, like, a lot of strategy in Truckkin. Because for me to, like, always win, <laughs> I feel like, you know, it, there's something more to it uh, in that. Um, but it also matters, too, like if it comes to playing like a professional game like if someone's like a pro magic the gathering player it is important that they have a little bit less luck where they don't use dice rolls and stuff as much because you know people are relying to like you know try to win and be a professional and you know win these big tournaments and stuff and players will get very upset if a lot of it comes down to dice rolls um but at the lower level you know we're not trying to have pro vindicated players win these giant tournaments and win grand prizes or anything it's about getting more people involved in playing the game so having the aspect of luck is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's cer- it's certainly, and there's 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 ways to go. There's ways to go about it um, on e- on either end of the s- of the spectrum. Um, it's this kind of thing is never a a uh, one a universal affair. 
but yeah and so every game i make you know will have different levels of luck and i will say this i like there's there's definitely times i've shown trucking off to someone and i don't go i don't completely try and so like i've lost games where i'm like going easy but like any game that i'm actually like just trying when i play it i have currently not lost it's it just me it just means it's all it just means it's all the more um, bragging rights if somebody does manage to beat does manage to beat you because eventually it's eventually it's gonna happen just as people get better at it. Yeah, and like I said, I don't like to say that because I know last time I said it like on stream, I was just doing it to try to be entertaining, being like, "Yes, I never lost this." But then, like once I like I lost like the very next game, and everyone gave me so much shit the whole time. I was like, "No," uh, but I was just trying to be like entertaining for the stream, you know. And in this case, I'm only trying to say it in case someone's listening, and they're like, "Ah, oh, Vindicated has like a lot of luck in their games. It's truck coon all these dice rolls, and it's just like a flip of a coin on who wins." It's like, no, I'm trying to say like there's. There's enough strategy in there to where if you know what you're doing, you can definitely optimize things to have like a way better chance of winning. Mm -hmm. And even of course, of course, I could I could take a I could go a bit unique in my in my case and say whoever loses has to has to drink a bottle of bacon soda. Oh no. I mean, and there's a thing too that I think people discount when it comes to like luck in games is that like like a lot of people just hate losing and so they'll pin it on that they'll pin it on luck as like oh i only lost because of this but the game's i feel like yeah well i feel like a lot of times you know being a good player is about optimizing all the aspects that you have control over and yeah some of that comes down to luck where it's out of your control but a lot of there's still a lot of elements in games that you have control over and every decision point you make matters i mean for example like um i play like flux sometimes which gets you know hated on by some people saying it's too luck based and there's a lot of luck in flux um i'm not gonna lie but you know there's definitely different decisions that i've made where it's like oh i misplayed that and if i played it this way um i would have won this turn or if i had just thought about this move one step ahead i could have won or if i would have done it this way like I definitely noted, and I and I do feel like people that think more ahead like end up winning that game more often than not. Um, so even though it's very luck based, there is a lot of levels of thinking to it as well. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that said, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out the um si the side project inv involved, and that is converting Truck Coon into a TRPG, which is going to be using the same system that you had developed with black paper moon correct so was i know i i know i keep i know i keep saying this but was that one of those things that just ended up happening during development yeah that's one of the later things that happened um that definitely happened after the co-op stuff after the quest cards um it happened one day when i was looking at Let's see, I was looking, I believe I was like looking at the different characters in Truck Coon, and for people that know, uh, they're all basically characters that are part of my other Vindicated games. You know, I've been doing this thing called like the Vindiverse, where I am like, people that become aware of these characters will see them show up in different games I'm doing, and I'm trying to find ways to sort of like share a bit of their lore, a bit of their story, and get people more familiar with these characters. Um, and Truck Coon, it's admittedly a little difficult because, you know, the whole premise of the game is a bit more superficial where it's like, oh, fun isekai, you know, it's just meant to be kind of goofy and it's not like a serious story when it comes to the actual like theme of the game itself. So it doesn't really lend itself super well to like really showcasing like who these characters are. Um, but, you know, I have like little like flavor text on some of the cards and the quest cards definitely add a whole nother dynamic in terms of like adding to their story and lore about like where they're coming from things like that mm -hmm. um and then so i think something was coming out about that where i was working sort of like with that in mind and then i was like well i already do have this art and i had this idea for their lore so i was like writing some lore about them and then i was like oh it'd be cool to kind of i think i was working on maybe doing sort of like a lore book that people could get where it's like okay you can get the you can get 
uh, Truck Coon, and there's also maybe a, a lore book for people on Kickstarter where it just sort of, if people want to take a look at it, it's like a digital book that you can look at with some of the art and some of the characters and the lore, what, whatever. Um, but then I was like, you know what, like, I could just make that into a tabletop RPG instead. Because um, then I started having the idea of, like, oh, yeah, like, you know, there's not, like, a whole lot of, like, isekai-based tabletop RPGs, to my knowledge, where it's about, like, oh, what do you get reincarnated as? Like, what kind of world do you go to? Um, things like that. And then, so it gave me sort of an excuse to sort of add the lore in as well. So, like, to showcase those NPCs, uh, or those characters as NPCs, so you can learn more about them and have them involved. But also... Um, have sort of a different aspect for a tabletop R RPG as well. Because also it adds a lot of different things that Black Paper Moon did not add. Um, whereas, like, Truck Coon adds, like, a lot of, like, charts and tables. Like, so if someone's into that, there's tons of it. There's, like, loot for, like, more medieval-style, like, isekai. Like, there's loot for, like, sci-fi, more, like, modern world. There's, like, different things you can be reincarnated into. Uh, there's different, like, mutations you can end up with if you want to, like, go that route. It's, like, an optional table where you can show up with, like, you know, uh, color blindness or a third arm or whatever it may be uh, just to make things exceptionally weird. Um, and it's just meant to be, like, a super fun, silly game. Um, I've even worked in rules to have it where if you die in a different tabletop RPG, you can have it where that character gets reincarnated into this tabletop RPG. Yeah. So I'm just trying to mess around with some fun stuff and, and just give p players a lot of ideas um, and um, while also sharing some more like lore about some of the Vindicated universe that I'm building. Yeah, and I, I, I think one of the big things that, I, that, I'm, cu that I'm curious about with, with it, since obviously I'm no stranger to Black Paper Moon since you visited the temple when that was de being developed, is... How one manages to keep that whole world creation set up within um, BPM sandbox? Yeah. So, what um, could you like more specifically ask a question with that one? I think it, I think it's more about how about how one ends up because one of the big things with Truck Coon is, of course, creating um, Isekai based on this mix and match setup. So gotcha. Okay. It's more about how one carries that into a TTRPG. Okay. Yeah. I see. I see where you're going with it. Yeah. No. There's definitely some like interesting things I'm having to work on with it, and um, it's it's definitely meant to be sort of like a fun idea, and just sort of like give players like, hey, here's my ideas for it. Like, here's all these different things you can take from it. Um. I'm definitely curious to see like what people think about it because I think that this TRPG will come out differently than the other ones I've done in a lot of ways. Um, I don't know; it's it's like hard to describe, but I just feel like the like the information that's in there, the way it's set up and stuff, is a good bit different, um, even compared to Black Paper Moon. But I think what's nice about that is that since it uses the same rule system as Black Paper Moon, but it's different, is it works really nice hand to hand with it. So if someone wants to play both of them or either of them like they kind of work together uh if, if players want them to but they can also be separate mm -hmm. now with that in, with that in mind what would you be shooting for as far as a release window not a hard date per se but like a, like a lot of the times when i ask this kind of thing a general ballpark yeah so for everything being offered on the kickstarter including the tabletop or the card game and the rpg um i believe it's set to october 2024 um i always try to set it back a little bit further than i think it will take um but it ends, it ends up being about spot on because i always try to set it back a little bit further but then things happen so then it does set me back a little bit um so currently it's october but i always try to do um i'll try to get out as soon as possible but currently october is the the current date I I can get I can get that, and I'm get I'm guessing that both that both the board that both the original card game version and the TRPG um, side affair those are going to be released around the same time. Yeah, though I just remembered I do have a prototype version of the TRPG that I will be sending out to people earlier, so people can take a look at like what I have before October, and then they can go ahead and play around with it, read it, whatever they want to do, so people can get an early glimpse of that before the final release. Mm -hmm. um, and also, if people are wondering, uh, I basically refer to Truck Coon as a card game 
on everything outside of the Kickstarter, which I'm not sure if I like doing this or not, but the idea behind that is on Kickstarter, is I have it labeled as a board game just because I felt like maybe the audience on Kickstarter is more like board game oriented and that's sort of like maybe like their mindset is they kind of may view that more as like a board game. I don't know. I still get confused as to like how people label certain things and which people label weird which things. When it comes to when it comes to when it comes to genre because a lot of a lot of board car, card and RPGs get get put under the umbrella of tabletop games which makes it really annoying for me when I'm looking this kind of stuff up. Yeah, so currently I have it labeled on there as a board game just cuz it seems like like mo- like I'll put it this way. So most people like searching on Kickstarter for quote unquote like tabletop games um they tend to be a little bit more like into the hobby which makes sense like they're on kickstarter they're looking for that specific thing um and so they tend to view themselves as like board gamers you know so that's kind of like where i'm coming out with that but when it comes to most of my audience they tend to not just surf but i have a large portion of my audience that is more like they don't they, they come to kickstarter like maybe when i launch something on there but they don't like surf kickstarter in that way and they and they may view themselves as a card gamer but not so much a board gamer so it's kind of like this weird sort of like thing i'm kind of stuck in between that i'm trying to <laughs> navigate mm-hmm. which sometimes is easier said said than done i can i can understand that but yeah yeah <laughs> with but with that said i do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here yeah, of course. It was a good time as always. I always enjoy visiting the temple. Mm-hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And yeah, and for those uh, for those listening, if you have any questions about Truck Coon, be sure to reach out, ask me. I'm more than happy to tell you guys about it. We also have it on Tabletop Simulator for those wanting to play and check out the game. Um, I do believe technically the boss rules are slightly updated since then. You know, hopefully we can update that on Tabletop Simulator. But in general, everything is, you know, good and ready to go on Tabletop Simulator. So you can check that out. We also have a website you can check out, VindicatorEntertainment.com, where you can learn more about Truck Coon and various other Vindicator games that I've designed. Mm -hmm. And some of which have been covered in one form or another on this channel. Exactly. But... With that, with that said, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!